This is Greg Olson, and I'm thrilled to introduce my new podcast, TE1. TE1 will chronicle a 60-year evolution of the tight end position, from its origins as an obscure, overlooked blocking role to the versatile superstar position that it is today. I'll explore the evolution of the position through conversations with some of the all-time game-changing tight ends. And just like the incredible tight ends we sit down with on my new show, the Chevy Silverado is in a league of its own. This truck is all about grit, strength, and dependability. The same attributes it takes to be a tight end. Hello, Hardwood Knox family. This is Adam Frommel here with my co-host Dan Favalli coming to you with another episode. We currently have, and at the risk of dating this, I guess, since... This could change as of tonight. Uh, we have seven teams left in the NBA playoffs following the Milwaukee Bucks' elimination in five games at the hands of Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, and the Miami Heat. We're going to be talking about that on this episode. We're going to be talking about the Oklahoma City Thunder's surprising decision to part ways with head coach Billy Donovan, what that means for not only their, their coaching search, but also whether they're going to be entering a rebuild or trying to run it back. And we're going to be going through some standout questions from our mailbag solicitations. Before we get into any of that, a shout out to our sponsors, DoorDash, BetOnline.ag, and NFL Sunday Ticket, which we hope that you will definitely be using this weekend with the NFL back in action. And also, before we get into the actual content here, Dan, how's it going today? I'm doing well. And before I ask how you're doing, I just have to say that I love at the top of this, you were like, I don't want to date this, but allow me to date this by talking about the playoff teams that are left. And Yeah, I mean, the uh, the Raptors could be gone tonight. but No, nope, Raptors in seven, baby. Talk about dating yeah, I'm this. I'm sticking right? with that, too. I'm sticking with that, too. I am doing well, though. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well as well. Um, I just I just finished watching Serena Williams enter the, the semifinals again uh, at the U.S. Open, which is always a joy. And uh it was a fun match, so I'm You told I'm me she was that. 39 before we started recording, and I almost actually— 39. Almost 39. I'm, I, I don't know, like, tennis player ages, and that, honest to God, just, just shocked me that she's been around. I know she's been around for forever, but it almost feels like she should be younger than 38. Yeah, that is roughly ancient in tennis terms. Yes, absolutely. Where did you want to start before we get into the mailbag? Um, Thunder or—and I guess we could—and look, we'll cover these more in depth because we are going to do look-aheads for every team— um, kind of beginning soon and then like taking us through the off season free agency, blah, 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 all that stuff. But uh, where did you want to start with the thunder and Billy Donovan or the Milwaukee bucks and the existential crisis that they now face? Let's do the thunder first. I, I, I think the the two most important questions are, are one, who are they going to turn to in their coaching search? And, and two, what's going to happen with Chris Paul? I, it, it definitely with the, with the latter question, it, it it seemed based on the Twitter video that he said, sent out, it almost felt like a goodbye to fans. Um, and I, I guess I'm curious if you think that's the direction they should go. Well, look, it's whether or not I think it's the direction they should go, they're headed that direction because the video, it felt like a goodbye. And then you decide not to renew Billy Donovan's contract. And then even the, the story comes out per uh, Royce Young of ESPN that he, you know, Sam Presti and Billy Donovan like kind of knew what was going to happen. So when they met, they just like had cheap beers together and reminisced about the last five years. So that's the direction they're headed in. I don't necessarily agree with it just because I feel like if you brought back Gallinari, added someone with the, the mid-level exception, you have all those picks, you have some salary filler pieces when you look at Adams and Schroeder and their expiring contracts that you could really make a run at expediting uh, where you are in the Western Conference. And look, you came within one win of beating the Houston Rockets, who were considered a title contender. All that said, I do understand it because Chris Paul is 35, has two years, $85.6 million left on his deal. While I think you can very easily talk yourself into those two years, either way, it's two years because like that just shortens your window and there's a chance he drops off even before that. And you're trying to build, if you're Oklahoma City, something that's that's really more sustainable. And while some people might point to, well, what if they want to remain competitive while rebuilding, they're still sort of positioned to do that because Shea Gilgis Alexander showed that he's not really ready to carry an offense at all, but specifically in the playoffs, like he's already really good where he could be a fringe all-star and you flesh that out around him. You have two picks, I believe in this year's draft in the, in the, uh, I think it's going to be in the twenties. So that's, you know, or maybe they only have one pick I'll have to double check that, but you, you have the draft picks, 
Um, so you can see what you can do if you want to keep Schroeder now, just because they're going to come off the books. You can look at how much it costs to retain Gallinari. But I think it certainly seems like they're going to let Gallo walk, and then they'll look to trade Paul. And I ultimately don't think there's a right or wrong move here for that call. Like, it, it felt like a matter of preference, and if this is the route they prefer to go because they have so many um, – Guys who are just coming up on new deals, you know, I didn't, we didn't know about Billy Donovan. We didn't realize that his contract was expiring this year. And then you have Gallinari this year, Schroeder and, and Adams next year. So it, it maybe it feels like sort of a natural crossroads for them. Yeah, it's, uh, I didn't mind moving on from Billy Donovan. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that he's an elite head coach. They had great success this year, winning 44 games unexpectedly, taking the Rockets to seven games in, the, in that first round playoff series. But I, I wonder how much of that is just a testament to Chris Paul's enduring excellence and the construction of this team rather than the actual coaching. It, it troubled me that he seemed unable to, to make the necessary adjustments in that Houston series, just like not not relying on the, the, the many guard and Lou Dort lineups as much as he should. It seemed like some of the adjustments were a little bit too late, which is an issue that we've seen since out since he really started this job back in 2015, 16 in the last year of the, the Kevin Durant era for the thunder. And maybe this is just my anti-Florida bias kicking in. Um, but I, I just never felt like he was an elite coach. Um, I'm not sure that there are that many better options out there that's always the tricky part with with making these decisions but regardless i i wish that it wasn't like the moving on from donovan that that inevitably has a rebuild following because i'm not sure that you need to you like if they did choose to run it back if they convinced cp3 to stick around if they did re-sign gallo if you count on more growth from gilgis alexander like this team has the pieces to be extremely competitive um, both now and in the future. But it does seem like the rebuild is is inevitable. Um, and, and it should be fairly easy to do given the all-NBA season that Paul just had. I mean, the, the conversation has shifted so dramatically from the prior offseason where it was like, wow, is this one of the worst contracts in the NBA? Would you have to give up multiple first-round picks just to move it off? to like maybe you actually yeah. get something back in return for him. I think it, it, it almost connects to our Bucks conversation that we're going to have because that seems like a really legitimate and possible destination for him. Yeah, there's. I'm interested to see what teams kind of crop into the CP3 sweepstakes um, now that they're open because, look, two years, $85.6 million is a lot of money. We already mentioned that he's 35 at the beginning of all of this. And you have to worry or concern yourself, oh, is there going to be this mega drop off? But I feel like after and then look, we don't even know where the where the cap is going to land and how teams are really faring financially after losing all of uh, the at least the gate revenue and then probably other revenue as well. And you sort of have to reconcile what's going to happen next season when you're probably not going to have fans either. And is there a chance that the schedule is once again then? shortened so that all comes to a head at the same time after the season chris paul had i think you could name um and this will eventually be an organic segue i feel like into milwaukee but i think you could talk yourself into like a bunch of teams for him and just at the off the top of my head like uh let's say someone actually this was i wouldn't name them but someone mentioned the clippers uh because you have patrick beverly as that salary anchor and if paul was willing to go back that would be incredibly interesting if you build something around Lou Williams, uh, Rodney Magruder, Patrick Beverly. Like, if you can do that, I that'd be interesting. Not a team I would name uh, on front. Miami would be there. I know they're supposed to wait on Giannis, but they're in the conference finals now. And I'm not going to say they beat Giannis to get there because he should have played more before his ankle injury. And then we basically had what felt like a game and a half of him playing on a bum ankle and then not playing at all. Uh, they could certainly be in there. Milwaukee is a team that... We already mentioned the Knicks will talk themselves into Chris Paul if they need to. Depending on what the Magic want to do, like gambling on Chris Paul wouldn't be the worst idea in the world. Philadelphia is an obvious one. One of my favorite ones that isn't being talked about enough would be Phoenix. Uh, they can build something around Kelly Oubre Jr. Would they be willing to give up Ricky Rubio in that scenario? So th that's probably where I would top out. I would normally name the Spurs there, but it does feel like they're approaching their, their own crossroads. I'm curious if of the teams I named or if, if there's another one, if you have a, a favorite fit for, for Chris Paul. Dallas could be a, a fun mention too. I'm not entirely sure how feasible it is, but that, that would be a really interesting look, just giving Doncic another primary ball handler next to him. Um, 
and could take away a lot of the defensive responsibilities too. But no, of the ones you mentioned, I think Phoenix is my favorite dark horse contender for Paul's services, and Milwaukee is my favorite obvious one. I, I think that the path to get Paul for Milwaukee is, is fairly straightforward. You know, you're, you're moving Eric Bledsoe, you're moving Brooke Lopez, uh, and probably some picks as well to get him. Uh, and, and from there, you're, you're looking to make cheap veteran additions around them and, and relying heavily on that Paul Middleton Giannis trio, which would be incredible and would fit together so well. I wouldn't hesitate to make a move like that if I'm the Bucks, just because you do need to to capitalize on the window as it exists right now before Giannis's free agency. I'm also not too concerned about Paul's contract aging poorly. There's only two years left now. I'm assuming that he picks up his $44.1 million player option, which we might as well just lock in now. Um, but he he's never had a game. You know, we, we talk so much about how diminutive point guards have trouble aging, how point guards in general, after they hit like 31, they, there tends to be a, a steep and market drop off. But his game has never seemed like one that's going to subscribe to those theories just because he doesn't rely on elite speed, elite athleticism. It's all changes of pace. It's all trickery off the dribble. It's getting to his shots and hitting those mid-range fallaway jumpers. It's knowing exactly how to play and where to be at all times. I just I, I don't have concerns about that contract anymore given the season that we just saw in a new location where he was able to play more to his strengths than he could in Houston. Um, so if I'm if I'm a team like the Bucks that needs to win right away, like, yeah, I'm, I'm going all in for it. I would say I'm less concerned, but there is the level of he can't, you know, cook people on switches like he used to with his handles. And so I think he needs to get, you know, he has that pull up mid ranger. Can he do more of those um, from three point range? And he's look, he's already kind of there. Like we've seen him just meander into pull up three pointers in I call it semi transition, like his entire career, and he could probably do more of that. So I'm definitely less concerned, but there there should still be skepticism there. Dallas is interesting, and it's funny because uh, th- they could build a package of Tim Hardaway Jr., Delon Wright, and then Justin Jackson, and that's basically the exact amount that you would need to have in a trade for for Chris Paul, which is like a hair over or around thirty three million dollars. I just don't know that they'd want to torpedo their 2021 cap space, which is why a team like the Bucks or the Sixers or even the Suns might make sense where they're not necessarily going to fancy themselves those 2021 players. Uh, I still think Milwaukee, even though it's obvious, is my favorite destination. And as you sort of mentioned at the top of this, it, it feels like there's a straightforward path, but but there also it doesn't feel that way because the questions I have are why would Oklahoma City want an Eric Bledsoe or a Brooke Lopez? Guys with – Brooke Lopez has three guaranteed years left on his deal. Eric Bledsoe has two guaranteed years um, for a total of $38.5 million, and that goes up if you guarantee a salary for the third year, which is $19.4 million. I think it's only three point nine guaranteed. Even George Hill, um, you know, he has one guaranteed year at $9.6 million, basically the mid-level next year, a hair under what it's supposed to be, and then a non-guaranteed year at, at $10 million. Why would you want him, and and why would you want Ilya Sova? I guess he has a non guaranteed salary, so so that helps. And then if you're Milwaukee, does it make sense? Like if you had to give up Eric Bledsoe, Brooke Lopez, and George Hill to get Chris Paul, I'd probably still do it. But you're also giving up a lot of rotation firepower there. And I'm not so worried. Look, Chris Paul more than replaces Eric Bledsoe, but George Hill, the shooting that he gave you, and then Brooke Lopez made all defense this year. Is there a way to build this where I might be more inclined to? Can you broker in a, you know, a a third and fourth team where you're making this sort of a hodgepodge deal where it's, you know, Eric Bledsoe, Ursan Ilyasova, let's assume Robin Lopez picks up his player option. You have DJ Wilson with the one year left on his contract, and then you dangle Dante DiVincenzo, and it's going to have to be a distant first round pick because you've traded yours through 2022 right now. That might be the better route to go. And will Oklahoma City look at it as, well, if we can get Dante DiVincenzo and or that first round pick for Chris Paul, maybe we're willing to take back some of that hodgepodge money, including Bledsoe, or if you can find a team, you know, what if Atlanta, are they willing to take on Eric Bledsoe to go along with Trey Young for two years? Maybe it's a possibility. Uh, That would be a route that I would explore. I don't know if Oklahoma City's interested because then you're looking at it as, would you basically accept cap relief in the form of 21-22, not even next season necessarily, plus a first round pick or DD to get off of Chris Paul? I think I would still because they were in the tax this year, but I, I don't know. If I'm the Thunder, I'm not as concerned about taking on those salaries just because of the situation that they're in right now. So Brooke Lopez doesn't make more than $14 million for any of the next three seasons. 
Eric Bledsoe does, but that 2022-2023 salary is only guaranteed for $3.9 million. So you can move off him if you need to. Um, but the, the books for the Thunder aren't that concerning to the point that they can take on those mid-level salaries without any real issues. Because the only big, uh, assuming that Paul has moved, the only big contracts on their books are Stephen Adams for $27.5 million and Dennis Schroeder for $15.5 million, both as expiring contracts. If Brook Lopez is coming back, you can easily move Stephen Adams to another team, maybe even if you do have to attach a sweetener to it. You might have to attach a sweetener, but when you have 400 first-round draft picks in the next decade, it's not as concerning if you need to do so. Um, Schroeder, I think you can, you can move as well, given the fringe six-man-of-the-year season he just had. And because... Because you're entering this rebuild where you have so many incoming rookies over the next couple of years on rookie scale contracts, taking up so many roster spots, I think that you can afford to have some bad money on the books. So as long as you're getting something for taking on those contracts, whether it is Dante DiVincenzo or whether it is a distant first round pick or a collection of second rounders or something from a third team that gets involved, those those contracts don't really concern me much if I'm the Thunder. Well, what would be so... I, I think that's a fair point. I still just, I don't know, like, if I guess if they could reroute them, maybe they see value there, or if they're looking to kind of just tread water, not at the bottom of the Western Conference, you might value having a Brook Lopez for the next two or three years, George Hill for next season, and maybe the season after that. Um, Bledsoe can obviously help you in the regular season, apparently not the playoffs, though. But if I'm the Bucks, then, I'm not including. If I'm giving up three of my you know, six or seven most used players. I'm not including Dante DiVincenzo or a first round pick, and that's where it gets messy. And so if they want yeah. Dante DiVincenzo that first round pick, I think you're, you're the Bucks. You have to figure out a way to to try and broker the hodgepodge uh, model just because you're already giving up so much uh, incumbent, so many incumbent minutes, and you don't have the tools to necessarily replace those. Uh, you're going to top out. If you trade for Chris Paul, depending on the timing, obviously, like let's say they're willing to, to use the full mid-level exception and it can still be the non-taxpayers because they can stay below the apron. I'm not like, are they going to divvy that up between two players? I don't know. Like if you're the bucks, you probably want to spend that on one just because they'd have in higher impact impact. I do think it might be a little bit easier to approximate Brooke Lopez's value on, on a cheaper scale, or at least with the, the mid-level this summer. But those are just really complicated. Hey, hey, honest at the five. Yeah. I mean, that, look, that's not, but full time, that's not something you're going right, to do either. Right. And then like, who's your other five? If you're keeping Ilya Sova, okay, but you know Marvin Williams is going to retire and that he can actually still hoop. So that was that was something they could have looked at bringing back. And, and that's just complicated. The price point matters, I think, for Milwaukee. I'm not concerned about Paul's money if I'm them, but what I have to give up to get him is certainly a concern. Well, and ultimately, I think it all comes down to how much pressure Giannis puts on the franchise. And, and based on what he said immediately after the elimination, that he's not going to ask for a trade and that you know, some people are, are are met with a wall and, and go in a different direction, but he wants to break through and he trusts his teammates and knows that it's hard to win a championship and wants to get better. Like those are all those are all statements that I don't think are going to put a lot of pressure on the front office, but he could do so behind the scenes and be like, hey, like I am considering leaving. Like, like I don't care if you throw long term assets. Let's win right now. It, it's very it's very conceivable that he could take that approach behind the scenes and we could see them be more more persuaded to to include DiVincenzo or a, a distant first round pick than they would otherwise be yeah i that's a that's a fair point um the thing i wanted to ask you before we go full on bucks is there any name among the coaching candidates that you'd be interested to see for okc assuming a rebuild i mean if they went with like a veteran guy where all of a sudden i don't expect Ty Lue's name to be mentioned here but if that's someone that uh is mentioned that would be surprising me because like I said I don't like you said excuse me I don't think like Billy Donovan necessarily elevated them but also how many different iterations of a team did he deal with during his Quite a half few. decade there yeah so I, I does seem like they're gonna go more the developmental route and Kenny Atkinson would stand out to me there I still think he got the weird shaft in in Brooklyn this would also be an opportunity where you can go within uh, I don't want to say an unproven assistant, but one of the assistants who don't have head coaching experience. I would have been very interested if, if Jacques Vaughn didn't get the contract that he did from Brooklyn, whether he would have been a candidate for a job like this, where it's sort of known that, hey, they're not, they don't want to be terrible, but they're not trying to win immediately. Because he did a heck of a job, I thought, in Brooklyn following Kenny Atkinson's departure, particularly in the bubble. And I think the Nets, you know, the optics of him being demoted, and we're actually going to get more into this in the podcast later on this week. They're not great, but the fact that they made him one of the highest paid assistants in the league, I do think says something about his um, coaching acumen, at least how they value him. So that would have been another name 
that's obviously off the market now that I still would have been uh, keeping my eye on in this particular situation. Yeah, I think two names that I want to throw out are, are Becky Hammond. Uh, Interviewing you, you for the Pacers take... position, by the way, apparently. Yeah, she's she's definitely going to be a, a big name candidate. Um, and the, the Spurs organization has shown nothing but immense respect for, for what she's done on Greg Popovich's bench. And I think that if you are truly rebuilding, then that is a fantastic time to to take a chance on her. Um, David Vanterpool is the other name. Uh, he has had a lot of success with the Portland Trailblazers. He and Damian Lillard had a fantastic relationship. He really helped with the growth of CJ McCollum a lot. And he has also succeeded as an associate head coach with the Minnesota Timberwolves. And he does have some connections to Sam Presti uh, because he was the director of player personnel um, starting in 2010. So he has been there before. He's going to enjoy some familiarity with the franchise. Um, and I, I think we'll we'll see his name come up for sure. Either of those two, either of the ones you mentioned, I, I think there are a lot of options here. And, and they are helped by the fact that they're most likely entering a rebuild and can afford to take a chance on, on an untested, um, an, an, an untested, I can't talk an untested coach who has not held the, uh, the top role before. You've counted on restaurants. Now they're counting on you. And while their dining rooms may be closed, they're still open for delivery with DoorDash. DoorDash is the app that brings you the food you're craving right to your door. I can confirm this. I've been using DoorDash quite frequently throughout this pandemic that we're all trying to survive mostly whenever i've just been jonesing for some wings could be the middle of the week could be looking for a cheat night i just i need my wings sometimes large orders i'm talking like 50 wings or or more uh and i can eat those pretty much in in one sitting so doordash has been great whether i need uh, contactless delivery or even if i'm just placing a pickup order they make that super easy as well just open the DoorDash app, choose what you want to eat, and your food will be left safely outside your door with a new contactless delivery drop-off setting. Choose from your favorite national restaurants like Chipotle, Wendy's, and the Cheesecake Factory. But also, many of your favorite local restaurants are still open for delivery too. That's what I've been doing, uh, using all these local smaller businesses to, to get my chicken wing fix. DoorDash has them all. Love that, that they're all just located on there. And right now, get this, our listeners can get $5 off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter promo code BLUEWIRE, all one word. That's $5 off and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app and enter code BLUEWIRE. Don't forget, that's code BLUEWIRE, all one word, for $5 off your first order with DoorDash. Let's dive full-fledged into the Bucks, though, shall we? So Let's do it. The I think that you're talking about Giannis putting pressure on the, the organization, and so... I think the few things that are clear is that they're not trading him this offseason. And the rumors already come out that the Clippers are going to try and make an offer for him. I don't really know what are they offering Paul George there. Like, I don't know what they have to offer that would uh, they would have an easier time going after him in 2021 free agency. Now, you mentioned his comments. People have sort of responded to that with saying, well, if you're actually committed to the franchise, we've heard this before. You need to sign the extension first. Here's what I'm absolutely doing, if I'm Giannis, is I'm signing the that extension either way like it's it's happening because if i want out i'll force my way out later because people can say he won't have the leverage you're not keeping a disgruntled star no matter how many how many years he has left on his deal if carl anthony towns requested out of minnesota tomorrow they would consider it i, I think you would have to um and th- maybe in that situation is different because he's so young and you haven't had as many opportunities to win but here fast forward a couple years if he has three four years left on his deal i don't think it's as big of an issue what i'm also doing is I'm not signing the extension now. It's going to be there, and the the monetary value isn't actually going to change. All you're going to have is clarity on what the salary cap looks like in 21-22 when that deal kicks in. Right now, it's slated for $125 million, which means this is a five-year, $253.8 million extension if you sign it. It's probably going to be lower, would be my guess, and if it's substantially lower, or if you can see that there's going to be a huge uptick in the year after that, maybe that convinces you to sign a shorter-term deal to increase your flexibility. The other reason why I'm doing this, and I don't know if players would actually think like this, but if you want to stay in Milwaukee short term, fuck with the other teams. Mo- uh, Miami, Toronto, uh, Golden State, like they're not going to do anything seismic until they figure out what Giannis is doing. And there are probably other teams that fall into that category as well. But looking specifically at Miami and Toronto, two of the teams that are in your conference, keep them in limbo. And yeah, you know what? The Heat are good enough where it doesn't matter. We can say Toronto brings everyone back on a one-year deal, yada, yada, yada. 
uh, still don't sign it. There, you th- that deal is gonna. He could get injured next season. It could be a catastrophic injury, and they're still giving him the super max. Like it's still happening, and that money's still gonna be there. So that's what I'm doing. If I'm Giannis, before we even get into what the Bucks are doing, and I'm wondering how you feel about that perspective, particularly the latter one, where it's like I me, love that last point. I've yeah. not really heard that expressed before quite like that. So that's uh, that's really interesting. I wonder. I wonder if players do think about it that way. That would be some interesting insight to get. But yeah, I mean, like he's entering his age 26 season. He has a distinct argument to be the best player in the world. He's most likely going to be the two-time reigning MVP. Like, yeah, like we we just saw how much play Kevin Durant got in his 30s coming off an Achilles injury, which is like the most devastating injury that you can have as a basketball player. Uh, Giannis is going to be fine no matter what happens this next season. So yes, by all means, like delay signing it if you need to. And that's not necessarily a an indication of a lack of commitment to the organization. He's said and done all the right things to this point. And I, I think that even if there's a long, long track record of stars saying and doing the right things before leaving, like he does deserve the benefit of the doubt here. Yeah, and look, he doesn't seem like the t- type of player that's going to request a trade anyway. So even if he doesn't sign the extension and it's not because of my idea, which might just be harebrained anyway, you roll the dice because he's that type of a player and you are still close to a championship that you still, if you have the opportunity to to sell him on staying long term, you take that over divesting him into a hodgepodge of assets, whatever they end up being. How many times am I going to say hodgepodge on this podcast? That's a... The smorgasbord of assets. Let's try and change it up there. So he's just you that have some tra- optionality with your words. Just remember that he's he's that transcendent of a player. Is sort of my point. So unless he requests for out, like you you can't read too much into him not signing the extension if I'm the Bucks. It, it's unless he requests for out, you're keeping him. And so now that kind of informs their off season. Uh, I don't the the Malcolm Brogdon stuff has now come up and been relitigated, and I think it's a hundred percent fair because you have. I believe it was Mark Lazary came out and said that they would pay the tax, but that keeping Brogdon was a luxury. It turns out that wasn't a luxury because they, it turned out to be too light on shot creation in the playoffs. How much of it did he add because that was never necessarily his role in Milwaukee? I don't know, but he's definitely probably a better option in a lot of these scenarios, especially against the Heat, than Eric Bledsoe was. And we saw that Dante DiVincenzo, who I was high on in the six-man-of-the-year discussion, just didn't really provide that that layer of protection. And, and it was thin there to, to begin with from him. So... Now, and I'm, I'm using this to frame this as I'm using this year's salary cap for, for my projections. And the Bucks should still theoretically, even if Robin Lopez comes back and they guarantee Ursan Ilyasova's $7 million salary, have the non-taxpayers mid-level exception in full at their disposal, estimated at you know $9 million and something. But there's a chance that that takes them into the tax if they use all of it. You absolutely go into the tax next season. If it's if you're not making any seismic Chris Paul moves, but even if you do, like you're you you have to use every chip that's on your plate right now because I, I do think you kind of I don't know that you sent the wrong message last summer with the Brogdon stuff, but it was it, it was weird. And then to say like, oh, but we will pay the luxury tax because we're going to in the future. If you kind of evade it now, even given the financial ramifications of the the pandemic and the shutdown, I don't think that sends the right message. Do I think it? guarantees that Giannis will leave absolutely not but like now you lay all your cards out on the table it's not just a matter of let's try and find an all-in trade whether it's Chris Paul Drew Holiday I don't really know if they could work themselves in the Victor Oladipo conversation my guess would be no um it it has to be we're going to spend too and yes you only have the non-taxpayers mid-level exception here's the thing that's basically the same thing as two-thirds of the league they're working with some form more than that of the uh, mid-level exception there's going to be a handful of teams with the mini mid-level and so you're already above them if you have the the non-taxpayers mid-level and because you're a contender in the east maybe that appeals to someone and i, I don't know the name to throw out i just feel like it's not going to get you a marcus morris but you know if the heat are really trying to preserve their cap flexibility uh if they're not going to give jay crowder like a huge one-year deal uh, to stay of like 30 million like a lot of people expect them to do with with um not Giannis Drogic, like is, is he an option? Does he become an option at the mid-level all of a sudden? The guy who would typically be available um, or would need to command more than that? I don't know. I'm just spitballing there. So even if using the mid-level takes you into the tax now, I think you you have to do it. And I don't think that's oversimplifying this situation at all at this point. No, you 100% have to. I, I, I think that the Brogdon situation was understandable to some extent, as long as they do show that they are willing to pay the tax when it matters. Now, we, it, it's not really fair to hold a small market team to the standard of perfection or else they deserve to 
lose their their marquee superstar. And that's essentially what we'd be doing if it's like, okay, like they they misfired on Brogdon and now Giannis has to leave because they they haven't demonstrated a commitment to winning and don't know how to build a team around him. You know, I I think that you have to allow for the possibility of mistakes, which is which that's what it was. Um, that mid level exception should be valuable this this summer. Uh, I do think that that someone like Drajic, a, an, an aging veteran point guard who is still playing fantastic basketball in the playoffs, would be a really intriguing addition. What if they get like Gallo or someone who's willing to take a pay cut to uh, to come play for an obvious title contender? You know, there there are options out there who I, I think that that can add to this roster, which is largely set in place for next season, barring a a seismic trade overhaul. You also get to have like Pat Connaughton off the books, which is fantastic because that means that Mike Budenholzer can't give him ridiculous minutes during the playoffs. Um, so, you know, there, there, there are positives to this situation. And I think that all of that plus potential improvement from Giannis, you know, that's, that's one thing that I don't think gets talked about often enough in this conversation. We talk about the trades that they can make, the free agents they can sign, the decisions they can make with player and team options and non-guaranteed salaries. But like Giannis is entering his age 26 season and he still has a lot to learn. Like, imagine if he comes back after a summer of hard work following another postseason disappointment with better footwork, with an even more reliable turnaround jumper from mid-range territory. You know, there are, there are so many ways that he can continue to improve his game as dominant as he already is that would just make this team even more competitive. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. The only pushback I'd give is I think Gallo would be a, quite a reach at the mid-level. It is, it is definitely a reach. Maybe you fall into like a Joe Harris... And look, the, the Chris Paul stuff, or even I feel like Drew Holiday is going to be a name that we hear too for them. That's also going to instruct how you handle free agency because Drogic would actually be a nice fit for this roster. But if you're going to go out and trade for um, CP3 or Drew Holiday, you don't necessarily need him. And then the flip side of that would be, well, if you're giving up George Hill and Eric Bledsoe, then you actually kind of sort of might. But that that's an interesting name that I didn't really think about for this team. The... Other, I don't know if this will become a topic, but Chris Middleton has received a lot of criticism for not being a conventional conventional number two. I kind of feel like that should be out the window now because what we're seeing is I feel like the limitations on Giannis's game, they kind of have these ripple down effects to, to everyone. And so unless, if you're saying his number two needs to be uh, a Damian Lillard or Stephen Curry, those are not conventional number twos because they're actually number ones. And so I think Chris Middleton has shown, um, even you know in the game four that they won after Giannis was, was injured, and then in parts of the game five that they ended up losing to Miami, like he can, you know, is he going to be number one level and a top 10 player in any given season? Probably not. But he can be the number two on a really good team. He's going to be able to go out there and defend the number two or the number three option on a team. Um, that's also why Eric Bledsoe is so important because he's probably going to spend the most time on number one options for this squad. And how, how does that change? If you go to CP three, it doesn't change at all. If you go to Drew holiday, who's just built for that type of role. But Chris Middleton to me is the quintessential number two on a championship team at this point. It's the people who need to frame it as you need a second number one, basically. And I think that that view on Chris Middleton was exposed in, in a good way for the bucks. And look, he's a name that I think would probably be, he's not going to be brought up in trade rumors, at least by on the Bucks' behalf, because, you know, if you want a Bradley Beal, you would probably have to give up a Chris Middleton. I just wouldn't do it. I think that Chris Middleton is just a better fit for this team for what he's going to do defensively than Bradley Beal. He's just a player that if Giannis did lead, did leave after next season, like, yeah, the, the three years left on his deal at that point are, are quite a bit. He would be at quick math right here, $113.8 million. I feel like he would become like one of the hottest trade commodities in the league. That That's getting too far ahead of the game. I just want to give Chris Middleton a shout-out because I think even though he's had better postseasons in the past, I'm basically looking at that seven-game set loss to Boston in was that 2018, I think it was. Um, I feel like he sort of validated himself in a way, and maybe part of that is because of how the Heat exposed Giannis a little bit. Yeah, no, he, he is 100% the classic number two that you want, and I think that just the with the super team stylings of the last decade that fans have been a little bit spoiled by the idea that you can have as you put it two number one options on the same team and just because the bucks don't have that second number one that that's not a condemnation of middleton's contributions he also played really well in the playoffs aside from his shooting slump at the beginning um you know he was he was asked to 
to, to carry a, a bigger load than expected and completely deviate from the Bucks' typical style of play, which relies so much on transition and semi-transition attacks and operate in a half court with a tough, deep defensive team throwing all sorts of options at him. And during that Miami series, he still averaged 25.6 points, six rebounds, 6.8 assists, shooting 41.7% from the field, 33.3% from three-point range, and 93.1% from free throws. Those first two shooting numbers aren't great, but given the circumstances, I feel like they're at least understandable because he was being asked largely to fill a role that he isn't meant to fill. And alongside Giannis, he gets to fill a, a much more comfortable one. Uh, so I, I don't have concerns about that partnership, and I, I hope that the Bucks don't either. No, I, my guess would be that they don't. It just that that felt more like a... I wouldn't even say it was a prevalent take nationally, but there there have just been... I don't want. I received a lot of pushback when I ranked Chris Middleton along with one of our Bleach Report colleagues as the tenth best player of the season. And this year, I don't think every year that's going to happen. But this year, given the sheer amount of injuries and limited a limited availability from otherwise top ten mainstays, that it opened the door for him to do that. And we haven't seen the All NBA teams come out yet, but it would shock me if he doesn't make third team All NBA. And if that's not a number two on a title contend, like I don't know who's who's supposed to be. And I'm not trying to say that it's Giannis is the, is a bigger problem for this team than anything. There's more about how they've fleshed out the supporting cast around him. I just think if you are going to say Chris Middleton, isn't the right number two beside him, you're saying, well, then Giannis needs a second number one, which is just like a weird way to frame that discussion. Yeah. Especially when the first number one Giannis is so ridiculously good. Right. And th- that's the thing that needs to be remembered throughout all this is the bucks are not screwed. They still have Giannis, the inside track on Giannis for another year, if not probably longer. Look, he said he wanted to stay there. And once more, I don't think his not signing the extension, which he might do, by the way, like that might, he might sign the extension. Again, I wouldn't because it makes life, at least I wouldn't make the decision until after free agency, at least because he has until the first day of next season. Like let, let the heat and the Raptors specifically remain in lurch. I'm just going to keep coming back to that point, but the bucks are still set up to kind of, run the East next year. Yeah, Miami's coming, apparently. They're already here. You have Boston. You have to figure Toronto's going to put together something competitive. I have no idea what Philly's going to look like. But The Trae Young Hawks. Let's not forget about them. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, let's not forget about them, but let's also forget about them. If you just added an addition via the mid-level exception to this team, like there's a chance they're marketedly better than this season. I think they need to do something more stark than that, but like this is not a doomsday scenario for them by any stretch. Yeah. And I I think that, and maybe this is entering dangerous territory, assuming something about players mentalities. Um, And this is neither a positive nor a negative, but some players seem more likely to, to want to go pursue opportunities elsewhere. And some players seem more likely to, to want to stick around and, and try to win in the original location. And for whatever reason, like Giannis strikes me as someone who falls into the latter category. Maybe it's just the way that he said things or the way he's handled himself and, and, you know, not wanting to to do anything but shoulder blame for for losses even in the postseason. But it, he just he strikes me as someone who who wants to finish what was started. I'm with Again, you. that's not a positive or a negative. It's just a statement of belief. And look, at you, we could be wrong, too. We've seen players say that they want to stay only to turn around and then leave. I would just feel confident saying I'd be shocked if he ends up requesting a trade. And I don't think his not signing the extension to just belabor that point doesn't equate to a trade request in this situation. Are you ready to dive into this mailbag, though? I am more than ready. Um, Let's start with someone who's calling me on my BS, which, look, I always appreciate here. Uh, Paul Hyham says, I know both Adam and Dan are big Nugs believers and Nikola Jokic fans, but I could not believe you guys talking about how the Jazz were a run-it-back team, but the Nugs need to trade for Drew because their window is is now. They seem like teams in similar spots to me. Can you elaborate? I believe I spearheaded that Nuggets take, so I'll I'll start with this one. Part of that is because I do believe that the Jazz don't have the assets to do anything drastic. Like, their trade pieces, you're not... If you want to dangle Rudy Gobert, maybe that's something worth considering, but you're not going to get the type of return that you're going to get for Denver should you dangle... Michael Porter Jr. with Gary Harris, Will Barton's deal, a future first, even Bo Bull at this point. And so I think there are more options for the Nuggets on the trade market that, to me, 
they would be obligated to explore should they flame out in the second round, which it does not seem like they're going to do. And so that was under the pretense of had they lost in the first round or if they just get destroyed by the Clippers, which the the games, except for game one um, on the Nuggets behalf, has been super competitive. They could, they probably should have won game three. They should be up two to one as we record this, and they're not. And so if they take this to six or seven games and they want to stand pat because they believe that Michael Porter Jr. is that wing, and I think we've put it it's been pretty clearly proven at least since the start of the heatles, like you need that, the the big three heatles, you need that really incredibly high end wing to win a title. And so the nuggets are in that weird spot where they're building around Jokic and Jamal Murray, a uh, high end guard and a high end big. Uh, that is Michael Porter jr. That completing piece. He's going to have to get better on defense, but he might be. The question is how soon it sure. He can definitely put up numbers. Now we've, we've seen it in his quote unquote rookie year. But if a Bradley Beal becomes available, I'm not dangling on Michael Porter Jr. I don't think in a Drew Holiday trade, that would be, and I think I said this, the baseline return that I need to get for him. Uh, but with the way Gary Harris is defending, um, and plus what Michael Porter Jr. is playing, I don't know if someone going into free agency next summer is who I would target. So you're, I guess I would say, aside from a Beal, if he becomes available, you have to monitor at least the trade market for, is there any other big name I'm not talking about Chris Paul either. It just becomes available. I'm not talking about Giannis either. I'm not even envisioning anyone because these names sometimes crop up that you just can't picture. I think you have to be vigilant on that, and you're obligated to look for that type of a move because you have the asset firepower to do it and are in this win-now window. The Jazz are in the same win-now window, but one, I don't think their top-end talent is as good as Denver's top-end talent, which would be Nicole Jokic, who's borderline top five, definitely top ten right now. And again, just having the, the asset juice that Utah doesn't have, I think opens more doors for Denver that they need to explore. The only thing I I really want to add to that is specifically with Utah, I think that it's more reasonable to want to run it back because we didn't get to see what this team as it was constructed was capable of doing. It's, It's easy to forget just in the wake of Donovan Mitchell's offensive explosion during the playoffs that Boyan Bogdanovich was a huge, crucial piece to this puzzle. They very intentionally deviated from their all defense, everything approach to have more of an offensive modern style throughout this 2019, 20 season. So when Bogdanovich, who was their second leading scorer, averaging 20.2 points per game in efficient fashion, had season ending surgery in May, that changed a lot. Um, And I, I, I felt like it was reasonable to want to, to see them run it back with this, the same core of incumbents because of, how much he alone could elevate them. Denver also had key absences um, during the playoffs. Will Barton, uh, Gary Harris for a large portion of their their playoff experience to date. Um, But neither of those is individually as big a loss as Bogdanovich was to the Jazz. So in addition to the asset juice and the the possible ceiling with Jokic and Jamal Murray together um, and wanting to maximize that by by parlaying some of the depth into trades that are going to help for the postseason. I, I think that Utah does have a more reasonable um, desire to to keep the core intact because of what was missing. Yeah, I, I think you can argue that to them, Boyan Bogdanovich is a bigger piece than Harris and Barton was to Denver. I, it's tough there because Gary Harris is so important to their wing defense just because they don't have a lot of better options. And so maybe he's on par with that. And if he's going to hit his threes, then you know that's a completely different story as well. So. I, I think you can make the case for both of them to run it back, especially now since it looks like Denver is going to be competitive with Utah. I just think Denver yeah, to be clo- clear, I'm fine with either of them doing yeah, so. Yeah, I wasn't trying to – maybe I came off as just being too exaggeratory in that uh, you know discussion that we had. Um, I wouldn't you know go into this offseason and say, if I'm Denver, I need to blow it up. But you know, you're know you so close, and you already have. If Murray's going to play like this, the flip side of that argument would be, well, if Murray uh, – I guess the Clippers series notwithstanding, but if Murray's going to be that guy in the postseason that he was against Utah, well, then why would you go out and get someone else? Because you know that you're going to have him as the the blanket. I think you could go either way, but there's, I, I get the concern too of if you traded a Gary Harris or a Bradley Beal, you're really weakening your defense there. Uh, if it's a Drew Holiday, again, if there's a way to construct that trade without giving up NPJ, like that becomes absolutely huge uh, to me. It just it's because Denver's closer; they have to consider more on the table. Next question, though, comes from Pete Rudkins, and his question is actually interesting. Not that all these questions aren't interesting. Bubble effects, question mark, is field goal percentage better, free throw percentage, other effects. And so I just pulled up some numbers here, and the 
uh, the average offensive rating before the stoppage was 110.7, effective field goal percentage 53.1. In the end of the regular season, uh, which was only eight games, you had an average offensive rating of 113.2, effective field goal percentage of 54.1. In the playoffs thus far, average offensive rating of 111.6, and effective field goal percentage of 53.9. So it's, again, higher than that um, pre-bubble regular season aspect. And I will say... Right now, the offensive rating, average offensive rating is a lot higher than it was for last year's playoffs, which is was 109.8, with an average effective field goal percentage of 51.3. There are still a ton of postseason games to be played, but it does seem like offenses might have benefited more from this. At the same time, I'm like not, I'm I'm almost pleasantly surprised that defenses haven't been worst in the bubble. And so I don't know if you could say it's an outright benefit for the offenses, but there certainly has not been a lag there. And if anything, it was an improvement and perhaps that's something you expect because you had particularly at the beginning of this guys working their way back into game shape. Yeah. I I think that the other big impact is the lack of travel and just players getting to, to refresh easier and to as mentally grueling as this bubble experience can be just the lack of physical toll that comes from trying to recover after a tough playoff game while also traveling to a new city on an airplane. Like I, I think that that that's making a big difference and we've, We've already seen, I think it was Dennis Lindsay who said earlier today something about how the the NBA needs to listen to the players and how much better they feel and how we might want to uh, to consider like baseball style series against teams to to minimize travel during the regular season as well. So I think that's that's something we're seeing as well that that could be improving the quality of games. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, what 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 you said is is most salient here. I think we can say if we move on to the next question. Um, this comes from Doctor Mantis to Toboggan. Uh, at Corbor, <laughs> asks who uh, he has two questions. Who are some trade targets for teams that want to take the next steps for rebuild, uh, and then also for rebuilding teams? He also asks what are some other potential coaching candidates. We kind of already covered that when we were talking about the Thunder. So I'll throw this one to you. Let's start with teams, and we probably already mentioned their names at this point. Teams that are looking to make the next step or get over the the championship hump. What are some trade targets that that you could see coming around this off season? I really like the idea of Phoenix going out and and making an upgrade at point guard. Like that's that's what I keep coming back to in my head. Wow. Whether it's whether it's making a play for Chris Paul or trying to go get Drew Holiday, uh, like a, any of those level targets um, would would be really intriguing. Uh, just given what we saw from that team in the bubble, uh, especially uh, if they bring back Kelly Oubre and you also have this improved version of Mikhail Bridges. Like this team is is pretty close to, to not just being a, a playoff contender, but something more than that. And I think that, that that could push them over the hump. That's where my head went went first, at least. The upgraded point guard thing is interesting because I don't necessarily know that that needs to be their primary target, but if you could go from Ricky Rubio to Chris Paul, I think you should do it. Um, I'd be more interested in them going after like a four to play alongside DeAndre Ayton. Maybe you found something with the Cam Johnson starting lineup. I feel like Oubre is sort of an awkward fit now because that starting five did so well. And then Dario Saric looks like he can really be in his bag as a sixth man. I don't know what you would have to attach to Kelly Oubre Jr. to get like an Aaron Gordon. And I'm not sure whether you trust his shooting enough to. Yeah, I don't, I think, I don't think that's a fit though. He, I, I think it's closer just because he's become a better passer and he always shoots well and catch and shoot threes towards the end of the year. But that might be a name worth considering I know their fans are really big on Jeremy Grant in free agency I think you probably have to become a cap space team to get him and that certainly divulges us away from uh from from the trade targets of this but they're definitely a team that I think could be in play for that uh win now piece the name that I keep coming back to and I'm not sure where I think his best fit would be is Victor Oladipo in Indiana because it seems like something is off there and the sample we've seen before he got to Indiana, then, you know, even before he had this quad injury that he was dealing with, the all NBA player he was in 2018, like there's a larger sample that says he's not that player. He could still be a really good player. And so he's going to give you someone who can compete on defense uh, off the ball, especially. And then if you have another guy who can create from scratch on offense, that ends up being a big deal. Imagining him as sort of a number two score is super interesting to me. The, the Suns might be a candidate. I think if the Nets are going to go the third star route, that's a that's a name that I would look at for Brooklyn. I'm not sure I'd be fully comfortable giving up Karis LeVert for him just because that contract LeVert is on is such a steal, and, and LeVert might be a little bit 
more plug and play than Oladipo. It's really tough to say at this point. I wonder if you could put something together there um, with Spencer Dinwiddie, Jared Allen, and, and future picks without including Lavert, and then you're just stocked on the wings. I don't know if that's absolutely feasible. Uh, Victor Oladipo in Dallas would be absolutely spectacular. That's a team that probably doesn't have the asset juice. I would love him in Denver, but that's not a situation where I give up MPJ. And I'm honestly not sure if you have to, if he's heading into free agency, has this injury, and then if it comes that he wants out. I mean, if you're looking at Gary Harris as the starting point, Monte Morris and a future pick, like, does that get you anywhere on that? Maybe even need to expand it to include Will Barton and take back some other money from Indy. Uh, you, you could certainly look there. Um, but he's a team, you know, even the Warriors, and this might actually lead us into our next question after I hear from you, though. Like, that's a team that... Uh, I think Victor Oladipo would be an absolutely fantastic fit on. Maybe you can even talk yourself into Minnesota. They have the number one pick. Are you willing to give that up? But he's a guy that I could see fitting on so many teams and has a high ceiling, even if he hasn't been there and had this really long sustained peak that makes him just this tantalizing trade option to me. Assuming he is even a trade option. Maybe Indy just refuses to move him. One name that I'm curious about, and I don't have any good destinations for him, is Blake Griffin, especially given the recent reports that he's feeling healthier than he has in a long time, that he's starting to work out six times per day, that he's far enough removed, or six times per week, not per day. That would be excessive even by Jimmy Butler's standards. (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, You know, the the contract that he has is still daunting. Uh, He's definitely not in his prime anymore, but I, I feel like he has enough skill left in the tank even not relying on his athleticism that he could be a really interesting addition in a number of places like if there's a route for a philadelphia or a brooklyn to get him as another complimentary star that could be that could be a really interesting move for detroit that's uh, where where could you see him going though that's what i'm struggling with um you know the, the, those two names i just threw out philadelphia and brooklyn i think are intriguing fits but working out actual realistic deals is tough um beyond that it's it's tough to find I wonder, options for him i wonder if philly just, i don't know what else would have to be involved in the deal would philly be okay going from let's say al horford to blake griffin right that's just i'm that's like a move where i like might not like it for either team but at the same time like screw it like that that would be it's an upside play but yeah, I, just, I don't, just because, I don't want to see Blake at this stage of his career like be stuck in Detroit as the de facto number one option because that's not what he should be now. If he if he's able to to go to this more uh, a more competitive situation where he can take on a lesser role and preserve his health, I feel like that he could be one of the absolute best tertiary players in the NBA, even following all these injuries. Do you have any rebuilding? team trade targets that stand out to you. I have a couple if if you do not, but you're better at this stuff than me, so you lead this one. So, one maybe it's I don't know if it's a buy low candidate because I don't think this team would trade him in that type of scenario. It would probably have to be part of a bigger package, but Anthony Simons had a ridiculously terrible year and if you're still kind of looking for someone who might have that pinnacle as a shot creator and maybe you can get more out of him as as a passer, and he'll give you some at least motor on defense, even if there's not a ton of discipline there. Like, can you scoop him up? Portland's in win now mode, uh, and they do have some, you know, aside from other first round picks plus Simons, they don't have a ton of salary filler unless they're going to guarantee a Reese's deal and then use him that way, which they t- could certainly do. That's just a name I'm looking at if you're a rebuilding team. Another one I might be looking at, and these are no specific teams come to mind, but a Marvin Bagley. Is Sacramento ready to sell medium on him? I was very high on him after his rookie year just because of the the shooting touch that he showed toward the latter portion, even on catch-and-shoot twos, but also from three. And I think, you know, his price point really isn't that great because he's averaging essentially more than mid-level money over the next two years, assuming that his team option on his fourth season gets picked up. He's at two years and $20.3 million. Are the Kings, like, kind of turned off by that because they've already paid Harrison Barnes? Um, they've paid Buddy Heald. They're going to have to pay Bogdanovich this summer they're gonna to have to extend De'Aaron Fox are they just willing to listen um is it sort of a move up scenario with the draft I don't know how far he would actually get you up in the draft order um but is there just a t- like you know Marvin Bagley I feel like he would interest me if it was in Charlotte he would interest me I'd rather have him as the four next to Mitchell Robinson in New York than whatever the hell the Knicks are doing now with with Julius Randle uh I don't know if you want him in a Chicago but you definitely don't want him in an Atlanta uh, he's kind of intriguing to me in Cleveland. 
Would a Christian Wood, Marvin Bagley front court interest you in Detroit? Probably can't defend worth a lick, but I actually think Wood might be an underrated defender. What about Bagley in San Antonio? Not really the type of player they tend to go after, I feel like, but he, you know, if, if they can develop his passing, maybe that's huge. That's just a, a name I'd be curious about. If I'm a team that's rebuilding, not in a rush to win now, and I can slow play this, I'm looking at Marvin Bagley, and that might be like the name I'm zeroing in on this offseason. A couple more names I want to throw out uh, that might be bigger names are, are Kyle Kuzma, just because I think the fit continues to be a little bit questionable with him not really having a starting role next to LeBron and Anthony Davis. And I could see Los Angeles trying to parlay him into something bigger. And Rudy Gay is a really interesting one to me, who has one more year left on his contract and is definitely not going to be needed in San Antonio as it leans more into a rebuild than it has in the past. He looked really good during the season restart. Averaged 17.9 points per game over his seven appearances, shot 45.7% from three, looked more switchable, more active on defense. Like, he, he is 33 years old. He'll be 34 by the time the next season starts. But he's got some left in the tank, and I could see him being a valuable veteran move to a contender. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about rebuilding team for a second, and I was like, that is incredibly interesting, and please delve further into it. But you Oh, no, I'm just jumping into rebuilding teams who could move pieces too. That's, you know, that, that's been a popular name for the Warriors trade exception that they have for Andre Iguodala, and I, he could probably be a good fit there. So I do think he's – and he's also, if you're looking for an encouraging sign for Durant post-Achilles injury, like Rudy Gay, not the same level of player, but he's been effective um, even at times at both ends of the floor since he suffered that injury. So – yeah, that, that that's an absolutely good name for a, a contender or, or even want to be a contender if you might. Think I would like to see him in Miami. That's my that's my dream fit for Rudy Gay. Just see the Spurs trade him into Miami's cap space or maybe they're willing to attach like something small to it. I mean, they're going to exactly. they're going to have incredible flexibility this summer. Mention the Warriors briefly. So friend of the pod, friend in real life, former co-worker Jacob Bourne asks. he has two questions. I'm going to ask you this question first. That's not really immediately related. Peak Jared Jack or peak Kirk Heinrich one on one? Who are you taking? I'm on Team Heinrich. I- I'm going with Jared Jack. We, just... we we apparently need to to start another one on one tournament at NBA Math and just have them play each other. Let us know what you think. Peak peak Kirk Heinrich was a was a a, a sneaky defender. Good yeah, hands. Jared good Jack hands. is kind of like this like tiny bowling ball, and so I feel like he could overpower him. He might be able to, but I don't know that he could stop Kirk Heinrich. I don't know. Both both of them are kind of reliant on their passing to set up any sort of self-creating offense, though. So it would be, I think it would be a boring one-on-one game. No offense to Jacob. Well, actually, a lot of offense to Jacob. This is, we're probably going to step on the toes of some of the stuff we've already talked about, but who should the Warriors target in a trade for their number two pick? Should they package it with Draymond Green or Wiggins for best return? Both are arguably damaged goods. Uh, Wiggins certainly is, even though I feel like the Warriors have kind of trumpeted him up since they've acquired him. My stance is that you trade the number two pick if I'm them. 100%. And you, you try like hell to keep the Timberwolves pick, which seems to be more valuable. Um, do any targets for you that you like come to mind? I don't have a feel for what they're going to be able to get back for this. That's that's the biggest issue here is that this is just like an unprecedentedly bad, universally viewed as bad draft class. And I, I just I don't know what teams are going to be offering, especially in this off season of uncertainty. So I think like you, you, if you can package it with Wiggins to get anything, you know, if it's a Victor Oladipo, then great. If it's somehow a Bradley Beal, even better. Um, but I, I think that you end up moving it for whatever you can get because this is a team that that needs no no seriously because this is a team that needs to win as quickly as it can as Stephen Curry and Clay Thompson and Draymond Green are all are all continuing to age and, and move into their 30s. Um, what are you going to get at number two if you use the pick that can help you immediately? The best fit for them is like James Wiseman, right, who is this entirely unproven center prospect who's really raw. And there's no way that you can expect him to be a valuable, positive contributor during his rookie season, which is what you need with that number two pick. There, there's not a player out there who is immediately going to come in and elevate the ceiling of this Golden State Warriors team. So you you 100% shop it. For what? I have no idea. I'll throw some names at you. Bradley Beal's not one of them. Also, one thing to consider is that if you end up with Anthony Edwards, I consider keeping it, and then maybe along with that Minnesota pick, you hope that Edwards increases his value as an actual player next year. And then if Giannis became available after signing an extension for some reason, or what I was actually going to say is if he left, and then Chris Middleton's available, or you just see if that trade package can be parlayed into the actual big star that you want now. 
immediately though, if you're dangling, dangling number two, this is the one I'm torn on. Would you trade number two for Aaron Gordon? For this specific Warriors team, I would. I would. Um, I, I think that he has been forced to fit into enough weird situations in Orlando that he's developed a lot of different parts of his game. I don't think that he's a star. I don't think that he's even a fringe star. But I think that he can 100% be a, a valuable two-way role player um, and, and accept having fewer touches, but also being able to, to serve as a secondary creator on some possessions and, and fill a lot of, of, of the gaps that this Warriors team is going to have. So yeah, I would do that. Would you trade number two for Victor Oladipo, knowing the injury history, knowing free agency? I would not. I I don't have, yeah, I don't, I don't have confidence in, in Oladipo at the moment until proven otherwise, as, as you mentioned earlier in this episode, the, at this point, the sample of non all-star level play is greater than the sample of our all-star level play. And I, unfortunately, and, and I hate that I have to say this because he's such a likable player on and off the court. Um, I, I have not seen anything since he returned that gives me an indication that he's going to resume being a star level player. He is also most effective with the ball in his hands, which is not something that I necessarily want on a team that has, continues to have Stephen Curry and Draymond Green. I would do it for Victor Oladipo. I'm not going to lie. The other pacer that I mentioned here is Miles Turner. Would you do that? And look, there's there could be other permutations to this deal. Miles Turner, you can actually get with if you use the trade exception to you know acquire, let's say, a James Johnson, then use James Johnson in number two to get. Miles Turner, are you doing something like that? In a heartbeat. Okay. In a heartbeat. Yeah, I mean, Turner he- with a three-point ability, with the defensive rim protection, like that is exactly the kind of player that the Warriors should be targeting if they're intent on acquiring a five to go along with the incumbents. The, the uh, Here's something else I'll throw at you then. A dual scenario where knowing how the Pacers do with wings, what if they were willing to do number two, Andrew Wiggins, Minnesota's pick next year, and then let's say Kavon Looney and Jordan Poole for Victor Oladipo and Miles Turner. Are you doing that deal if you're Golden State? Yeah, I am, especially with the added benefit of getting off Wiggins' contract. Is there, if you're Indiana, can you talk yourself into that deal if you're Indiana? That's the tougher part. I think it depends on how, how much they're willing to, to commit to the Sabonis led core, um, which after this season, they very well may be willing to commit to. Um, Having Wiggins' money isn't ideal, but getting the number two pick for the, a team that is like in, in a competitive flux um, would, would be would be a very valuable asset. This will be my last one for the Warriors um, before we get some quick hitters to, to finish this up. Would you trade, and I'm not even sure the Spurs would do this, but would you trade number two for Rudy Gay, Derek White, and I think what do the Spurs have number 14 this year, number 13? Spurs have number 11. Would you do number 11, Derek White, and Rudy Gay for number two? Yeah, I think so, especially because just given the weirdness of this draft class, is there really that much of a difference between number two and number 11? Like, you're not going to be able to control which player you get quite as easily, but, you know, there, there are still... This, this feels like one of the classes where the best player isn't going to be a top five pick. So, so what, I, I think that you, it's more acceptable to take you know, a, a, a veteran without as much ceiling at number 11 than at number two. And that could be what, what Golden State needs. So if you're San Antonio, you wouldn't do that is what you're saying then? If I'm San Antonio, I don't think I'm giving Derek White away just for the ability to move up nine spots. I, I think that's probably fair. Actually, the real last one, I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't do this if I were the Warriors or the Knicks, but Mitchell Robinson and number eight for number two. In a heartbeat for Golden State. I, yeah, I, I think I just, you and I both love Mitchell Robinson's game. He would be an ideal fit there, but New York is not doing that. Um, all right, I'll try and squeeze in some last ones. So here's – this one comes from um, Phil Sizemore. He's asking about how do you feel about – what is your take on the Lakers going big versus small debate? And so I'll say this um, before I let you answer it. The numbers, they've basically been like equitable when you look at their net ratings in the regular season, plus 5.2 with – uh, per 100 with Davis at the four plus 5.8 when he plays the five in the playoffs, they are plus 12.5 points per 100 possessions with him at the five and then plus 14 with him at the fall four. the sample sizes are incredibly small, but I want to know how you feel about what is the best version of the Lakers? Does it include Anthony Davis at the five? Does it include him at the four? Does it not matter? The best version of the Lakers has Anthony Davis at the five. 
you know, as as important as JaVale McGee and sometimes Dwight Howard can be to that team, like that that is where they are most difficult to guard. That is where they're most effective on defense. It allows everyone to to continue to play in the roles that they're most comfortable at, even if Davis is continuously pushed back at the idea of playing center for anything more than a handful of minutes or in certain situations, especially against the Rockets. I think that you have to because the Rockets are always going to win the style battle and force you to adapt to them because they have no other options. They're not going to suddenly throw out Tyson Chandler on the court and be like, Hey, we're playing a more traditional style. Now we're not going to take a lot of threes. Like it's what you have to do in this specific series. And I think that with the two, one lead that they've already accrued, they're starting to realize just how effective they can be even while catering to the other team's style. So I would 100% continue to go with that smaller lineup. I and just moving forward, I think that's his best position. We don't have to worry about him being pulled away from the rim as much. And like, look, at the end of the day, I don't care if he doesn't want to play to five. Like I just I'm I'm so over I talked with this about um the athletics mode at Keel. It's just weird when players have such aversions to certain positions nowadays. Uh next question comes from Adam Bronstein. I apologize if I mispronounce your last name. It could be Bronstein. Are either Kelly Oubre or John Collins good defenders? No, I would say, I would say no. I would say that Kelly Oubre Jr. is gonna give you more on the ball, and then John Collins is like weak side protection as a helper when he's playing the forward. Feels like it's improved a great deal over the last year plus. I don't know. What's interesting with him is if he can be a full time forward defender. Just when you look at the direction that the the four spot seems to be headed in where they could be these glorified wings. And if they can put the ball on the floor and you don't have a stationary shooter maybe to stash him um, alongside, I don't really know what you do then. So that would be the bigger question with him. Kelly Herbert Jr. is just a guy that feels like he should be better on defense. And he can really do stuff on the ball. Um, but we've seen the highlights of him falling asleep off the ball. He's not that egregiously bad, but I also just don't think he's he's reliable there by by any stretch. I'm going to focus on Collins here. Uh, we've seen mixed results to this point in his NBA career, which is why I say no to is John Collins a good defender, but I think that he could be. Uh, we, we, saw, we saw positive returns during his rookie season, especially when the, the, the Hawks decided to play him more at center as the biggest player on the court, and he was allowed to use his, 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 his athleticism in a more limited space. As a sophomore In 2018-19, he was asked to play more on the perimeter, which was a huge adjustment and not something that he'd really done at Wake Forest or in the NBA. And that's where he got in trouble. But I also think that he he started to pick up some stuff by the end of the season. And then this this past season, the one that's still currently in progress for teams not named the Hawks, um, (laughs) they they kind of meshed those two together and got some mixed results. It's hard to play interior defense on a team with an absolute sieve and Trey Young on the perimeter because he's going to allow so much penetration that you have to pick up um, behind him. But he has the tools athletically to make some sort of impact. It's just a matter of gaining the awareness and probably setting into settling into a more defined role than he's been able to have during his first three seasons as the Hawks have moved him around and tried to figure out where he's best. But I do think there's potential not for him to be a good defender but for him to at least be a passable average one that's you've convinced me i'm still just not not entirely sold but that's a that's one of the more optimistic takes i've seen and it does it feels like it makes sense final two questions super quick we've already touched on this and also one may culpa or clarification oklahoma city has one pick this year because philly did get its top 20 protected pick at number 21 um that's hysterical kind of this one comes from David stat guy uh his question his question is about the Suns and since we already touched upon them I thought that uh it would be a little bit easier to cover this what's the Suns best realistic off season strategy run it back and build on this year's progress or try to grab a uh, free agent or make a trade and try to push the process along um I will say I would juggle between running it back and looking at the trade market because you have to jump through too many hoops for them to become like a real cap cap space player this this summer you probably have to get off kelly Oubre's money and then bid farewell to dario sarch and or aaron baines perhaps both of them and so just i don't know what who you're going to get in free agency that makes it worth let's say losing two of those three guys knowing that one of them is definitely going to be kelly Oubre jr and so i think i would land on running it back or you know can we uh if i'm the Suns, can we attach 
uh, number 10 in Kelly Oubre Jr. and get something interesting just because Oubre's money, it's expiring. It's not bad, but it's $14.4 million. Um, you could probably do something with that. And so that's kind of where I land with Phoenix. We already mentioned some potential trade targets for them. I would absolutely love Victor Oladipo there. Chris Paul as well. I'm a little higher or a lot higher on the potential Aaron Gordon fit. Um, if you certainly use the mid-level exception, I would operate as a capped out team and use the mid-level exception. Maybe that gets you a wing. It's probably not going to get you in the Marcus Morris or Jay Crowder or even the Joe Harris conversations, but it it'll it should get you someone who is helpful. I wouldn't mind seeing them trade for a veteran like a Rudy Gay, um, as as we were talking about earlier, or making a bigger move and going after Chris Paul or Drew Holiday. But I'm also totally on board with them just choosing to run it back. I, I I was totally buying in to the the bubble experience Suns that we saw for that eight game undefeated stretch, and just the the improvements that Devin Booker has made to become just this all around superstar who's actually trying a little bit on defense now. Ricky Rubio is excelling in his role. DeAndre Aiden showed so much growth on both ends of the court. He looks like a not just a competent but an actual good defender now that he is. He he actually has an understanding of the nuances of NBA big man defense, which is notoriously tough to pick up on during those first few years. Mikael Bridges looked fantastic. Cam Johnson looks like a long-term fit in that starting lineup. I love all the pieces in place here, um, and I, I don't think they need to make any moves to be, as I said earlier, even more than just this last last birth playoff addition. But they could they could pursue something even bigger. I, I don't I don't mind either direction. Uh, I, they don't need to make a big splashy free agent signing or a big splashy trade just for the sake of making any moves. But if they do find one that's going to help them, then by all means, go for it. What would be more preferable for to you for this team? Become a cap space squad, knowing the collateral damage you'd incur. Um, Kelly Uber Jr. Let's say plus one of Sarich or Aaron Baines, and then you sign Danilo Gallinari or you basically keep this roster as is. Uh, perhaps you could look at trading Ubre, but you add Paul Millsap in free agency. I think I would lean towards towards the latter. I think I would too. Even though Paul Millsap's kind of had a rocky playoffs, he's reestablished his value versus the Clippers. And him playing next to DeAndre Ayton just feels like it works. And also in yeah, small ball yeah. five lineups if you wanted to go that route. And I think that when you have DeAndre Ayton and Devin Booker as your core pieces, that you just naturally gravitate more towards defenders than offensive players. Final question here, and I'm assuming it's quick just because you had notes jotted down on it, comes from Kate Chura. Are there any real trends regarding ref assignments and game results? Yeah, I mean, there really are and there aren't. And that can seem like a, a confounding answer. But you know, you, you see the occasional ref who tends to have a better record for the home team or tends to have higher scoring games, but those tend to even out over the years. There are always fan bases who think that a ref is biased against them. The most prominent ex- prominent example right now is probably the Celtics fans with Tony Brothers, who you know notoriously had a, a one and eight stretch for the Celtics in playoff games that that he officiated. But it it, it always feels like. It's more just like reaching for something that's going to fit a preconceived notion. You can dig into the referee statistics and find something that's going to support your point of view, whether it's an an official calling more fouls or favoring one team over another. But those tend to be such marginal differences over longer and larger samples that if there is any difference, it's a very, very small one. You know, I just, I, 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 I just refuse to buy into the conspiracy theories, especially in the wake of the the Tim Donaghy stuff from from a decade or so back. Um, it's it's so hard to believe that you know Adam Silver is calling in to you know the the officials and asking him, them to to marginally swing a game in one team's favor because they want a certain desired outcome. You know, you can always find stuff to gripe about because these calls are so hard to make. I, I think it's really notable to me that whenever we dispute a call, we're using slow motion video replay to maybe find something to disagree with. And even then it can be tough to tell. So we're talking about these referees who are trying to to make calls with the speed of an NBA game and trying to pay attention to so much stuff like, yeah, the officiating has been poor during the bubble, but it's not in a way that is intended to favor one team or over another or the NBA's desired outcome or anything like that. So 
there's no conspiracy theories at play. That's really disappointing that you don't feel that there are. That's like not hot take. I know that's right. shocking. I know that's shocking. That will do it for us, though. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. We did not get to all of them because we did feel like we needed to talk about the Thunder and, and the Bucks here. Uh, maybe we'll get to them next time. Please keep questions coming in, even if we're not solicitating them. You can get at us on, on Twitter. You know the handles any way you'd like. Um, we'll also we'll try and make these mailbags more regular because these are one of my favorite podcasts to do. So as long as there are questions, we will be here to answer them. Please, please, pretty please, though, do not forget to rate, review, and subscribe to us if you have not done any of those things. Um, subscribe and download all our episodes wherever you're getting your podcasts. Whether or not you use iTunes, please just head over there. Throw us a five-star rating. Write a review, even with constructive criticism or questions in there. We're always reading the reviews that pop up. So if you can give us that rating, write a review. We have so, so, so little a few reviews and ratings compared to how many people listen to each episode. So if you could help us juice those numbers, we would really appreciate it until next time. I leave you all with a shout out to the one, the only future NBA math one-on-one tournament champion, Jared Jack.